Has disappeared, and, and we're we're ready to go. I think for the afternoon. Thanks everybody for coming in for what I know is going to be a rare treat, and it's a great honor and privilege to welcome back uh, a part of the Archigram team um, who have been not just frequent visitors but longtime shapers of the space and thinking and ideas, not just in a school like this, but in architecture as we know it today. It's a great opportunity for us uh, during a lunchtime conversation and as a first event for a, a long series of visitors that will be coming in in the next couple of months related to a show that's opening tomorrow evening to carry around, to carry forward a conversation on some of the ideas and thinkings, thinking that came together with these remarkable architects uh, a few years ago and which continue today. Uh, this is very much an unscripted event by design. Um, this is really meant to be a conversation in the true sense of the word. It's, um, I think, a lost art in architecture today generally, um, in a world increasingly scripted, monologued, information strategically organized, um, to be able to just get people together around a table and to talk about some of their ideas and thinking um, in not just their own careers, but how those careers have unfolded over the years and relate to the work of other people. It is, I hope, going to be a kind of personal conversation. This is, as everybody in this room knows, um, uh, what could we call it, an insider audience to the kinds of ideas and thinking that are at the table today. Um, and for that reason, I'm hoping there'll be plenty of stories and anecdotes and discoveries along the way. Um, this place has been shaped for many, many years by ideas that came together in images, publications, and projects that David, Dennis, Mike, Peter, Warren, and others associated with the Archigram group um, took forward from small conversations at tables like this in this building to have an immense influence on how many of us understand not just architecture, but really the way architecture is thought, taught, argued, and debated, and in fact performed, thinking of some of the great performances that Archigram put together. Uh, <coughs> we, we were able to bring together a different constellation of Archigram uh, almost exactly two years ago in a conversation that was related to the great clip stamp fold show across the way in the gallery, which was a remarkable chance, I think, then to first discuss the work after many years away from the school. Uh, one of the things that came out of that conversation that stuck with me for the last two years, which is an incredible aside that someone mentioned that afternoon, was that the work of Archigram began, and for an audience today to understand this, began with the production of documents for what, what today you would think of as almost microscopic audiences. In fact, one of the amazing stories that afternoon was that some of these kind of papers, the famous set of papers that Archigram produces in eight or nine editions over a few short years, basically stopped when ink was when the ink ran out or when the electricity was turned off and that produced the print run and i think for a culture today and architects that measure audiences by thousands of blog hits or visits or to realize that those kind of ideas can begin with a smart conversation amongst a small group of people with the confidence that that conversation will carry forward and go out is, I think, one of the great, great lessons for all of us today as we look back on this work. Um, and I think for all of us to realize the power of small numbers at a certain degree, not just the four or five people that make up a group like this at one moment in its configuration, but that they in turn are talking to an audience that might be a quarter the size of this room at any one time, but with a belief and an expectation that ideas can develop and fold out of that. And that's really the legacy, as much of the projects or the ideas um, or the insights that we all associate the work of, uh, of Archigram with. It's really that lesson, I think, for all of us today more than anything that's the one to hold on to. To have faith that in a conversation with two or three or four students or a half-filled lecture hall on a Thursday afternoon, that in fact that's where architecture lives. And I think that's really the great lesson for all of us. Um, David just mentioned to me, and, and I'll, I'll stop my, my comments here, but David just mentioned to me that he lost a cardboard box recently, which I had the opportunity to see my first year here teaching, mid-90s, I came in and snuck into the back of the first year studio when David brought in a cardboard box which he unceremoniously dumped on the table, which contained these materials. 
And David's presentation of his thinking and the group's work was simply to put it on a table and let the students look at it. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal display. And most of the first-year students didn't know quite what to do with it. But they sort of rummaged through it a bit, looked around. It was a, an amazing demonstration of what teaching really is. And it stuck with me for about 15 years. I don't know how long ago that was. But the idea, really, that it's just a matter of holding the work together and getting it out for other people to look at and interact with that will drive the conversation in unexpected ways or in new forms, and it's something we've been experimenting with for the last few years here by, for example, bringing, bringing students today in to work with some of the ideas that were developed within Archigram in the 60s to produce their own versions of these kind of projects. I'm going to turn over now to, to Francisco uh, Gonzalez de Canales. If anybody here sees on eBay a complete set of Archigrams. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I said at the beginning, this, this event is the first of probably two dozen conversations like this we're going to do in the next couple of months associated with this exhibition, which is opening across the way. Um, Mike Webb, who's, who's joined us today as part of this conversation and returned to the school, um, produced a remarkable project in 1962, I believe it is, which is still being worked on today <laughs> and is, will be part of the presentation across the way, which also plays a formative role in some of the thinking within the group. Um, that first group, that first works project in that exhibition is really a chance for all of us in architecture today to revisit the topic of architectural projects and how it is you can embed practical, theoretical, and other kinds of knowledge in singular projects that can in turn shape other projects. And this conversation, as I said, will be the first of those. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Francisco so he can say a few things about the group more formally, and then we're going to just open up the table or the floor or the microphones and start at it. Okay, thank you very much, Red. It's very difficult to start a formal conversation because the, the aim is what was to be informal in a way, and, and it is because it's lunchtime, so it is welcome uh, if you, you are hungry and you want to have your lunch here with us and to have a kind of lunch conversation. And uh, I was very intrigued uh, with the Archegon group from the beginning because in a way there were like students that were agitating other students and it's very good for, for all of us as, uh, together in this school that you are now students and in a way you, you would be able to be Archegon as well and uh, it's something that is always fascinating me that any of you could be Archegon and could be as influential as they are uh, being today. Uh, the difficult things about how to, to think about Archegon today is this idea of putting a first work. It was very, very, very diff difficult to define the first work because uh, you don't know exactly when it's coming. It's probably uh, not always the work of a group, but it's the group, uh, the, the work of, of uh, ideas coming together. So in, in some ways, it was uh, this uh, thing of taking the work by, by a particular component of the group was very difficult for us, but in a way it was also very compelling because it was giving a clear idea of what we believe was the beginning of a kind of ideology in architecture through the Archigan group. And I will try to somehow develop these ideas uh, later in the conversation, how I think that that scene center is somehow uh, conceived uh, in a very special way, very different from, from architecture that was made in that time. And in a way, it's very uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, consistent that it was uh, rejected by examiners mm -hmm. uh, in, in certain <laughs> ways. Uh, uh, so... Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the group, uh, uh, maybe uh, not, not so formally, but uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Michael Webb for his generosity in, in our exhibition. I'm co-curating the, the exhibition with uh, Brett for uh, one year, uh, and it's been a very long way, but finally we are going to be opening this tomorrow, and thanks to people like you, and also Denise was helping with our archival material, uh, David, uh, for, for your commentaries, and, and so on, and, uh, and Mike is probably, and, and that's why we were bringing him uh, here that uh, was our first thought is probably the most precocious of, of the group because it was almost famous uh, with uh, 22 years old or something like that it would, it's the fourth year of, your, of <laughs> yeah no, and it was amazing like in 1958 everywhere everyone was talking about him and, uh, yeah, that, that, high it's, point uh, of my career yeah <laughs> 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 no, but, but it's incredible that someone like Raynan Banham was able to coin a term for the things that you were doing at that time mm. <laughs> that's what 
was incredible. And uh, this idea of uh, the, the bubble architecture, the bubbleism, even. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. uh, uh, all that. I mean, I, I'm allowed, we have to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. Because this is a question, one of the questions I wanted to ask you. It's called First Works, but it, it, the, the project you've got is not actually Mike's first work. So it, I it is not. Why you've chosen the second. <laughs> because, for instance, I, would, I have a much higher regard for the first one. I'm sorry. I know. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, because it did something which is really hard to do. That those drawings that the, the, the furniture factory have oh. actually created an oh. ism on their own, didn't they? Which they made Baalism. <laughs> I mean, there are actually not many examples of it. So your uh, uh, critic might say, well, that wasn't much of a movement. But actually, it, it was a real turning point in the beginning no, no, I, I, English I, architecture. Yeah. So I wonder, well, why did you choose the other one? Yeah. And, uh, um, I, can I quote Pevsner about your esteemed <laughs> project? Oh, you certainly may, yes. Me. He said, uh, uh, within the schools of architecture, there are some disturbing trends. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the other day a design for a building that looked like a series of stomachs sitting on a plate or bowels connected by bits of gristle. So you can see this dis what is, seems perfectly sort of anodyne now, is that the right word? Sort of yes. uh, okay, created absolute havoc with this sort of intelligentsia at the time. So you've, I, I'd better give you time to answer my question. So why did you choose this other project? No. Firstly, in theory, I'm teaching. No, okay. <laughs> Thank you, David. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't answer I, you. I, I'm not yeah. saying it's not a brilliant piece of work. Particularly no. in time, far from it. No, my respect. Extremely envious, since you wanted us to be personal. Extremely envious of uh, Mike's. No, but I, I will be a really extreme. I just think this was... To, to be able to invent a movement with a series of drawings, yeah. I think it's just an amazing... You know, there isn't Garyism, is there? <laughs> and work like deconstruction weren't invented by architects anyway, they're invented by other people. Also, so, there was, you I'm see, sorry, John Davidson, and what happened to him? He was a student in my year, uh, <coughs> and he produced another bowelist building <laughs> and um, so I, it wasn't me alone, there were other people and then Hodgkinson, he wrote the magazine article, yeah. he was doing similar stuff so it wasn't How do you explain the convergence? How did it all start circulating during those, those few months or a couple of years? Well, I if, think if it is the case I would say at the Polytechnic, what provoked it all was the desperately bad teaching at the time huh. that it forced the students to produce something interesting because we were so overburdened with yeah. being office fodder for London offices that we wanted to do something rebelling against it. Yeah. I, I think a reactionary faculty, every school should have one, yeah. you see, in order to bring out this sort of work. You're making an argument for bad teaching. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> bad teaching. Absolutely. I'm very good at <laughs> no, I would like to, to answer your question, David, because it's quite provocative. And in a way, if you're saying that uh, the manufacturer's uh, factory or is, in a way, creating it, its own ism, uh, what I thought when I saw the simple as the first time, it's, it's almost creating an archigram. So that's, that's the difference. I mean, one is solely his own ism. And the other is the beginning of a group. Yeah. Uh, because I think that many of the ideas, many of the ways in which, in which the, the, the project was thought are going to be the core parts of, of Archigram later. So that's what I, yeah, so what, what I saw. But I think a first project yeah. can be defined as one in which one really feels a certain thrill and self-confidence about the work one is doing. Okay. And you could say, for example, that the first project is really the park shelter you get to design in first year. Mm -hmm. you know. But I think it's a good choice. I think you made the right <laughs> choice because I, I really got into that. Contrary to what the good professor there said, <laughs> I, I did love and enjoy doing it in a way I never felt before. <laughs> and it still means a lot to me, which is why I'm able, even now, to work on it. You know. I think one of, one of the topics with this being a collaborative group in a, in a show like this is, of course, you probably have at least four or five first works 
because yeah. you each have your own piece of work. And one of the pieces that David would never say it in public, but the mosque that we exhibited a couple of years ago in, in your yeah. show, which Not is 1959, one, yeah. I think, in a way also formally sets yeah. a kind of language which within the group becomes, yeah. in fact, it becomes most familiar maybe decades later in, in certain projects being realized. Yeah. But yeah, the idea of there being fact, multiple yeah. firsts and that it's not a one-off spark. Isn't it extraordinary, you see, since I lectured last night in the Darwin Lecture Hall, I was forced to say something about Darwin, and Henry Russell Wallace, who almost beat him to the draw with the evolution theory, and that it suggests that evolution was in the air somehow, and certain people were able to draw it out, and I think... David up in Nottingham was producing the mosque and we were doing furniture buildings in Palace Down in London hmm. and we didn't know about each other didn't meet till later but we were producing working on the same sort of things so in a way the projects become a way for you to they're like they're the opportunity to meet one another they give you then the com the basis it for became a yeah it became a visiting card i think yeah, well, you yeah. that, that different uh information environment that all these people it's nicely they're all so young like could be I was going to ask him another question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, says the architect just the archigram syndrome. Do you, you know when you get old and you're English, you start to realise how the English language is misused. You know, it's, yeah. so I didn't know what a syndrome was, so I looked it up in the dictionary. Yeah. Well, that it's is. concurrent sy symptoms of a disease. So we we the symptoms of a disease. We have been seen in that way. It's because of Pesna, you know. It's is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> disturbing <laughs> things, I right? know. <laughs> I mean, we, we've touched briefly on, on obviously there's a there's part of the conversation that would be very interesting it has to do with the collaborative impulse of it I think one of the unique features is the kind of group basis of the project, the argument, the ideas at a time in which architecture as a discipline certainly is still dominated by the singular personality and in fact whether at that time let's say in the early 60s where advanced age individual pioneers, let's say, and at just that moment the spark of group thinking in not just Archigram but running through Italy, parts of the States mm. and others mm -hmm. starts to emerge and that's a subtext that's really of this collection that we were interested in. But another side of it that I've always been struck by with Archigram that might, might connect you back to the larger cultural project in a place like London would be the way in which you, a, a kind of instinctive impulse not just to draw buildings or to make more interesting forms, to build strange structures, but to also have a kind of communicative impulse mm. Mm. that says, look, part of the project is communicating ideas to audiences and inventing them, and if we run through the range of your things, and I'm thinking of the great photograph I know of Dennis in one of the opera performances, that there's a kind of performative side to the group, that there's a communication side, that there's an installation exhibition side, and all of those get bundled together. And in a way, it's mm -hmm. the collaboration between those rather than the four figures, which is a very interesting model for architects to rethink today, mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. the various multidisciplinary um, things that are going on in the new technology. But I'm just wondering how that came about. Like, how did you decide to do that? In that you were drawing interesting buildings, making interesting projects. Who says, let's print a pamphlet Huh. Or let's put on a slideshow with 10,000 images in it and pack everyone in a room like this for the afternoon. I mean, how does that come about? Is it hmm. Dennis? No, 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 no. Inexperience and enthusiasm, I think. Nobody would publish stupid work anyway. I mean, they live in, uh, that's huh. what I was going to say. Huh. About they live in quite a different yeah. uh, information environment, so you have to you have to do it yourself. And of course, it's something Damon Hurst understood as well. If you want to do it yourself, because nobody else can. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's it. Was really quite simple in, in that respect. Nobody would publish, so mm. and then you keep meeting people. Like mm -hmm. A lot of student work was never could never it, be published. It was also it was a moment, technically, like the beginning of the yeah. internet was that suddenly there was a, a new sort of outlet which was offset by their printing. Uh, just as now, I mean, it's ten years ago, 
you know, if you had work you wanted to publish, you went on the net because it was a new media that was accessible yeah. and inexpensive. You just needed a tiny bit of knowledge about how to do it. And in 1960-61, that was the same, but with also <laughs> lighto printing becoming available. Uh, but you were uh, keeping exploring on this, and I think it's very interesting how you went from a pamphlet almost to the opera. It's a multi-screen, multimedia. In a way, it's yeah, that's part of the same. Yeah. So, so how do? You, of course, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. How, how do you go? This is a natural process because you are deploying this kind of relationship between architecture and media. Is yes, no, something it, unconscious. It, so it all also. I mean, the, what my role in the group no. is about technology. Not just about you know high tech, but about yeah. how you know, like like I can pull up an image for you on the screen because I know where they are and I can find them and you know tell me what you want and I'll show you you know on the Pete Cook's first projects sort of thing like that. Now what happened during the 60s was the carousel slide came. Yeah, and at the beginning of the sixties, they were. I don't know. Is the one on the stand there? No, there isn't. No, it's. But I mean, they were just a block of heavy metal yeah, with three buttons, you know, and a, and an on-off switch, and that was all you could do. And we, or or I, started inventing ways of, of automating them. So we had some incredibly elaborate sort of huh. large perspex discs on a spindle that rotated in front of the lens with a notch out of it and a, a pressure switch that when it hit the notch the slide ch was changed and that was at the beginning of the 60s but by the middle of the 60s there became uh, more sophisticated ways and by the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s then the the ways became um, electronic rather than the electromechanical. Hmm. So the opera was only possible. Um, the first version of the opera ran that we showed it here yes. in, this, in this room yeah. on uh, four screens with eight projectors, and the, the show was controlled off a, a quarter-inch tape. And to make the slides change, on the back of the tape there was an aluminium foil. And it ran across oh. a couple of posts, so it made a connection, which then triggered a, a, a box Amazing. that I yeah. made that had four relays in it that changed all four projectors. <coughs> I mean, it was very crude. Describe now, how, the, how, how were the screens? I've always been curious. How did you arrange the room? We Where had, are the you screens? You know, photographic the, paper. Yeah. You know, large rolls. We had a large roll of white photographic paper and stretched it from that corner over to that corner with various sort of props behind it. Uh -huh. And then we built a, a stand on that side that had all the projectors on it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the opera, I mean, it, mm -hmm. just like the first issue of a magazine, it was speculating on the possibilities of the available technology. Mm -hmm. So, but it wasn't, the opera itself wasn't about technology, it was about what we were doing, just like the yeah. magazine was about what we were doing. Yeah. But we were. But it's something that was also in the in yesterday's presentation. In a way, you were reverting how architecture was uh, working till then. That in a way, it was about uh, building up a, a construction, a physical thing. And and I, when uh, somehow Mike Webb was presenting his Sim Palace, seems to be uh, trying to communicate a sensation to the drawings. And that's why he said that the the, the, the axonometric drawing was totally wrong. No, Big perspective drawing. No perspective, it's sorry. Wrong <laughs> so, Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what, what I'm saying, that in a way, uh, when you're making of architecture a multimedia, a multi-screen opera, then totally shifting what architecture was before, in a way. Or, or, or you weren't conscious, you know, that this is kind of totally different way of understanding what an architect has to do. Well, and that's a crazy notion that we might project 840 slides in an hour. Yeah, yeah but... <laughs> With lots of loud music as well. Yeah, but when... It's still there in the background. Right? When we are saying here that... Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I'll potato, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um... Yeah. I mean, what sort of what is sort of intriguing me is why so many young people find this 
in the world because we are, are, are antiques and it's interesting to know the, the list. I mean, the sort of the list of people in a way, I know some can come, some can't, some only want uh, first class airfare, so say sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But that also betrays a, a sort of subtext of who you're interested in as a young person, which, uh, which I'm not sure because when we uh, when I can't speak my college, but when I was that age, I wouldn't have come here to, uh, to hear a bunch of old men talking about <laughs> what they're doing. What they're interested in that? Because you, you, um, how yeah. you, you try to keep yourself alive yeah. somehow. You know, there's no way I'm going to learn Photoshop or Maya or, or Rhino, which should be. Well, I would have that in my Rhino. With <laughs> what's the other one? Programs, programs. Uh, so. Um, sort of, they're never going to tell me. Mm. I know they're never going. You're never going to tell me. No, interested. I'll never find out. <laughs> but the, the audience that we had was students, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 We would be in a, a room, and mm. there would all be this, you know, nineteen, twenty years old, <coughs> anxious to hear some loud music and pictures, and and so uh, that was then. And then, sort of years later, uh, sort of two stones heavier. Uh, hair disappearing part. You find yourself in a room with the same age group, so I find it quite extraordinary. Yeah. Really. Um, That's cool. But they're never going to tell me, are they? Why are they here? Well, you can ask them. Everybody's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you know, we're why kind of watching Sky. I mean, I, I mean, uh, something like that is more interesting. Uh, the replay of Arsenal winning or <laughs> Liverpool drawing. <laughs> no, but surely the the, the uh, kind of resurgence of interest, and like so many things in so many fields, ideas and activities and projects go through cycles. But surely, surely a kind of acceleration of technological change, we could say, in the last decades or so, let's say the distribution of electronic networks which you so vehemently not just imagined but argued for in terms of the consequences it would have on a school or on a, on a discipline like architecture, the realization of certain of those kind of realities is one way to explain interest and influence, right? I mean, I think you, uh, in terms of comparing the eras, what I'm most struck by was in a generation with the 60s, a belief in a kind of visionary project for a future and not just an inevitability of the future. That the future is going to come in some form which today we all might say is going to come through Google, Microsoft or some horrific kind of business plan. But that there could actually be a vision for the future which projects and ideas even within architecture can help shape. And one of our impulses, one of our interests in the First Works project is to capture a moment in architecture, and it goes well beyond the small group of people that might be here today, for a, a belief in shaping that future through projects, through the projection of projects and communication. I think that is part of what I can imagine a place like this wanting to bring back into a culture of architecture. I believe that vision might still be possible. It might be quite difficult, might be suspect, it's almost a degraded kind of term in architecture today. Mm. But there was clearly something running between these projects that argued for that possibility. That's, that's true. But, but, and I think with the, the, the furniture pack, the reason I like it so much is it's a very clear example of a way of working. Yeah. You examine a technology huh. and then you try to uh, make a trajectory out of that of what its architectural consequences might be. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue, uh, Dan, I'm completely out of order right now. Uh, I would argue that the interest in technology lies not within architecture, but within the means of its representation, mm. which is why, and I'm sure it, it's a, a bit, well, everything's a phase, isn't it? So, but that's, I think, what I mm. um, miss most uh, in what these people are doing, how, but Mike, uh, where his hair would stand on end at the thought of um, what, what's the what uh, Ferris Man, and now somebody else uh, gets a big erotic charge out of a, a, some computer software. And I find I, it's sort of interesting, and maybe I'm wrong. That's the impression I have. Mm -hmm. So I can look at them all and say, eh, you're just. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm talking too much. But, 
Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Maybe just because some of the audience today will have missed the, the center, some of the discussion yesterday, it'd be nice to show a couple of images yeah, of the project for people to remind the, the point that about the choice of materials and things in the project uh, that David is hinting at. Yeah. Really, if, you, if someone's drawing this now, it would be huge, it would be great. There'd be piles of paper, there'd be reams of it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? No. Why? Because of... Well, because you'd be drawing with a computer and, that, and it would be all quite different. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine that somehow. Uh, am I supposed... But well, there are reams of paper. I mean, I've spent the last two or three years going through Mike's papers. But, you know, there, there are drawings that nobody's ever seen. Well, go back one. I, I thought I'd lost that one. Well, um, that one? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, let me put on my. Mind, hold on, okay. I've got to put on my glasses so I can all see it. All provision, all explore, a lot of exploration and the provision. Which is that difficult on a computer or not? The computer is always seem to be finished. Do you find that or not? You think I'm wrong misguided no those are um, obviously that drawing has been worked on much and the filth on the surface it's lovely because when you were raised there's this white streak where you were raised Uh. (laughs) you know yeah I mean they're really working out drawings and um, trying things out (laughs) yes um Mikhail. That drawing that is worked on over X years. Yes, yeah. yeah. so indeed. How do you do that in exactly. my station? No, I mean, it seems as much the conversation... The software's gone out of date in six months. Yes, exactly. You <laughs> have to port it into something yeah. else. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, but I, uh, one of the most interesting features of the project, surely, is that it's, it continues to be worked on. And I think, hmm. as much as we might say the contrast between a mechanical drawing made in the early 60s and electronic drawing today is serious and significant as different media, surely one of the great differences between that project and what we would think of as a more familiar kind of architectural project is that it's never ending. No. Right? That it's a project mm. that keeps getting worked on over and over and the idea that that becomes almost not just a first work but an endless work is a really interesting way to frame or discuss a yeah. career. And I'm just curious the impact it well, had I, on you guys yeah. and the rest of the group. This guy just wouldn't stop working on one particular project. Well, I think the idea I could be wrong, but I don't seem to remember any exhibition, any architecture exhibition, whose subject has been the first projects that an architect did. And I think it's a wonderful thing to do. And what it needs really is to learn, to find out what the architect who did that project thinks about it now. Can he bear to live with it, or she? I mean... You know, when you look back and you see the uh, breadth of vision that was your juvenilia, your work then, um, how would you do it differently now? Uh, presumably, all the people who sent you work, they can live with what they've done. As I'm thinking of <laughs> Johannes Brahms, the composer, who had a big bonfire at the age of 40, mm. and he burnt almost everything he had done prior to the age of 40, because he couldn't bear to live with it. Mm. And I just wondered, you know, that is an extreme example of someone for whom the early work is wretched, it's horrible, they can't stand it. And in fact, the latest version, which is in the show, of one of the drawings Dennis put up, which is the perspective image, Mm -hmm. I actually sprayed flat white Krylon paint in one mad moment uh, over everything that I didn't want to retain. And uh, it came out looking all right, actually. It could have been a disaster. I didn't want everything to go, but just to see the vague outline was all right. But it's so wrong to do that project with a perspective projection. Ask me why, it can't say. I have no idea why it's wrong to do it in perspective. It's something about being orthographic space, this building, not perspectival space. You know, I mean, the Acropolis is about perspectival space. 
because that view from the propelia is vital. But this is about orthographic space. You haven't told us how you can live with your first one. <laughs> oh, I love this. I can look. Yeah, it's just the projection. Your first love. No, I think this. Is, I still think, contrary to what my very dear friend here says, it's a fantastic project. May I dare say that? I'm not a boasting man, but I think it's a great project. This one. Yeah. But I think that David was very much seduced by the by the bubble, <laughs> and, and I think that your spray house is very much reliant. No. I mean, not not because of the shape, because of this idea of the, the, uh, exploring a technique and how it's going to change architecture and how it's going to change how people are living it. And the spray house is very much about how spraying things is going to change the way in which we think about architecture, which is more clear. It's more clear uh, than even than the the, the Vowel project. That because in your project, as you said several times, you didn't know how it it was going to be built at first. Well, uh, not not very. Not very clear it, idea. It didn't become the essence of the form yeah. of it. Whereas in David's yeah, project, and in David, I it loved is. That one. in David it did. So that's a, a kind of interesting difference. I mean, you are more consistent on that, yeah. but you are opening up the debate in a way. So this is kind of two different things going on here. Yeah, see, now we're starting to take a bit of dirt. <laughs> now we're actually starting. <laughs> <laughs> it might be interesting. I mean, I, I've not heard the question I'm asked. It's really idle. So <laughs> that's about as far as I know. I'm, I'm wondering, it's, it's not been asked too, too much publicly, but, but where do the differences lie? I mean, is there a way in which you can describe the productive features of the group, this immensely productive, influential group, because the differences between individual projects or ideas were turned into instruments that could then push the debate along. I mean, did you disagree over any fundamental things? Were, were we... Did you, did you see different roles and describe them clearly? I mean, in, in ways in which people became... Stepping on treacherous ground. Yeah, right. No, but I think it would be an interesting for an audience that... Yeah. It's not just the rise of technology today, but also clearly the ways in which new kinds of technologies are privileging collaborative forms of thinking that, of course, is what intersects with the, with the group twice over. I mean, it's, it's a collaborative operation built around technology, and it would be interesting for us to know more about the actual circumstances of the collaboration. Is it, a, is it an accidental thing where the four or five people come together periodically for a project, and otherwise you're off orbiting and doing different things? Is it a more calculated kind of performance? I think people would be greatly interested in that today. Mm -hmm. It changed through the period. Hmm. I mean, we, at, the, at the beginning, Mike and David and Peter were working together and Ron, Warren and myself hadn't met them. Yeah. I mean, we knew them through the first issue of Archigram, but <coughs> that was all. Uh, two years later, we were all sitting together up at Euston Station yeah. in an office, and not just the six of us, but lots of other people, mm -hmm. like Robin Middleton and mm -hmm. Dear Crosby and so on. Mm -hmm. and everybody was interested in discovering technologies and so on. So you yeah. get somebody come in, you know, waving a clipping from a magazine or something that, you know, describes some new way of, of like here, of spraying plastics onto surface to, to make an instant mold. You know. mm. But it, it, it wasn't uh, formalized in any way. Yeah. But then two years later, these two guys were off to the States and were teaching in Blacksburg. And, you know, you, there was no sort of email <laughs> going between us. And every now and again, you get a funny postcard. Huh. So, you know, not quite know what to make of it, but it seemed like good. Mm. It was quite, I think it was quite innocent, actually. That's my recollection being rather. Uh, Nice, uh, but like a uh, falling in love, really. You just, uh, it's the things which aren't said. Yeah. So that I would always know, right? and I know now yeah. what he thinks about all sorts of things. Not everything, but quite a lot. Yeah. I know I could show him a picture, and I'd know exactly what he was thinking. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I can't speak for my colleague. It was never, I never saw it. It, it was called a group. But I wouldn't say it was. I, I, old sort of uh, six, early seventies word, a collective, a loose, yeah, yeah. a loose sort of collective, who uh, met at various times 
for various reasons and and uh, in one says a sort of mutual admiration society you know, I've always uh, mm. regretted that I couldn't draw that Mike, right. it's, a const it's a constant source of aggravation. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I see him, I just think I want to throttle him. <laughs> 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 you feel so bad about my table. <laughs> you, you have to do the computer now. Learn the computer. <laughs> this will get it. This will get too late. So it was innocent in a way that I think that probably the people in this room oh. can't be because they know too much. They have access to too many things. Uh, they have too many choices. I don't know how people deal with their shop. It's just too many choices. Uh, Peter always makes the, you know, there's a huge difference in like in collaging on Photoshop yeah. or collaging with your scissors uh, on magazines, yeah. which always repeats that and it always talks about. If you wanted a zebra, uh, two centimeters high. You just had to go through hundreds of magazines to find a zipper two centimeters high. <laughs> because there was no photo. Whereas these guys, they could make it by testing that piece of your screen. But I mean, I feel sorry for them. <laughs> choice, is choice is a terrible thing. But, but surely people were saying it in your world about having that stack of magazines that the generations before <coughs> that didn't have. You had the magazines at least to start the zipper. Yeah, Yes. Also, <laughs> Whenever you're bringing them in two years ago. I, and so I meant to try and thought, how can I make bread across? Uh, I was going to bring in a, a copy. Charles Tashima, I sent him a little angry memo about clippers on the screen. You did, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a nice. It's a danger of falling into the David, same way. Yeah, 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 that's what I was um, looking for. Yeah. 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 Look, look, while David prattles on, look around at the screen because here's another fact of the group that David sent me this because it's about how to skid a car if you're doing a movie sequence in a car crash huh. sequence. And um, he thought it, I suspect, looked like the drive-in house drawings mm -hmm. and uh, therefore cut it out and sent it. And it's uh, so one of the wonderful... That's David as a teacher teaching me, I think, which is lovely, I think, that thought. Mm. Um, but I, I w I've always felt I was both the victim and the beneficiary of the education I received at the Poly. And I r both envied and decried my colleagues' ability just to draw wild shapes and call it a building. And for me, buildings had to work a bit. You know, if I was going to have a curve shape, there had to be a reason. Because that was the result of the Poly and its teaching. And I always thought Peter especially was almost facile in a way, wonderful and facile at the same time that he could create form. Hmm. Thank God he, he's not here, is he? No. <laughs> he's on his way to he's wherever. On oh, good. He's on a plane, wonderful. Yes, yes but I, I envied him very much and his, still do. Going over to Crab the, oh. uh, the other evening was a really disheartening experience because it's, he's doing such beautiful drawings that I love them. I mean the drawings really do become a kind of language between the members of the group. In an interesting way you can say that's a, a kind of platform. Mm. You have different, mm -hmm. clearly very strong and different positions or arguments for the kind of drawings or images, but the drawing, I've, looking through the archive and I've thought about this, the, the way in which th there was a kind of common language that made the conversation happen very quickly. I mean, one of the points that in Dennis's story earlier was that it comes together in quite a rapid, form, you know, over a two-year period or something. Mm. Suddenly, six people who didn't know themselves, didn't know one another, are configured together in the office, apparently sharing the office up the road. Something has to allow that conversation to happen as quickly as it does, and I think it seems mm. that's certainly that the, the kind of talent with the medium of drawing is one thing that then explains why the conversation could happen and go so quickly. Mm. It seems which mm. just raises questions today about what might be those kinds of platforms. Is it the drawing again and a return to the drawing as a kind of language or is it other media or technologies or other interests even? I wouldn't know. Mm. Mm. I, I still stick by the belief that it's technology which huh. drives architecture one way, either as now in the way it's drawn, the way it's represented or in what you can do um, 
we're misguided. Um, they're very still believe that's true. Though. Yeah. But, but, oh, and perhaps that's where I think um, it seems like MTAC here, you know, we're experimenting with technology and its architectural uh, consequences. But I think we were lucky, Frederick, uh, <laughs> reminiscing again, which is so boring for uh, young people, I was just. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, that we had an enemy. We knew who the enemy was, and I'm not sure these people know who the enemy is. That's you know, true. we had a moribund, uh, the, the the impetus of modernism yeah. was, was completely dried out, and so you had this moribund English profession, uh, or we regarded it as moribund. So you really knew who you wanted to embarrass, who you really wanted yeah. to take to task for their, uh, their lack of imagination uh, and it, perhaps it's a little bit uh, difficult now because you see a lot I'm sorry I'm not <laughs> but, uh, I you see a lot of really interesting built projects which yeah. and you can go to schools of architecture which are like uh, years behind projects now which are being built yeah uh, you know, with, and then, uh, but it, for us, that absolutely wasn't the case. Yeah. I can't think of any project when we were working that was uh, kind of technically more interesting or yeah. formally more developed. Um, but it's but it's interesting in the let's say in the argument you create with that advanced orthodox modernism of the time and late fifties, early sixties, end of the Messian project. A very English component to how you structure that argument, I would read, is the fact that you never openly attack that other side. In fact, you just gather great energy and interest around an alternative and go a different direction, but it's never a case of holding up Mies or holding up the slabs that are being built up in Euston Road at the time and saying, look, those are just fundamentally wrong and here's why. Mm -hmm. It was a very polite, I mean, it's very interesting. I, I would agree completely that the enemy was there but you just don't acknowledge it. I mean, in a way, the orthodox, the orthogonal, Messian architecture of the time is just forgotten about. Hmm. And I think that that kind of balance between having an awareness of the of the enemy but not feeling like you got to attack it to form your own identity is an incredibly uh, both English and intelligent <coughs> strategy. It seems. Mm -hmm. But did you read Charles's mm -hmm. email? Did you read what he replied? Because it was it just posed really, a really uh, interesting question about the, uh, the sort of uh, polemical way we were able to behave. He suggested you just can't do that anymore. You have to behave in a much more disciplined way. Uh, but whether, I'm not sure I agree with him. Yeah. I think it's a good argument. Because his mic's work could never have been done by a committee. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was an individual act. Uh, you could say, no, you can't do that anymore, there's no individuals, we have to all work together, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in the end, I think that for me, anyway, this, that point of creativity, and that's a word people don't like to use very much, it is an individual act, yeah. particularly with the help of other people. Yeah. But, uh, it's an invention, point of invention, isn't it? Mm. Which a, a committee can never achieve, and I think that's probably the the difficulty, particularly as schools of architecture, like the air, as it gets larger and larger, then you have to have these other form these other yeah, yeah. layers of stuff, don't you? So, but now that you're talking about teaching, I'm very interested in, in, in what Mike would say about uh, uh, after his disappointment at the poly, how did you solve uh, this when you started teaching at AA in 1963, I think, so pretty early. So what, what were you bringing that was better from what you were receiving what at the poly to, to the AA? So what, what was your idea of how you should be teaching in 1963? Yes, when you say teaching, at the AA. Actually, I seem to remember it was helping Peter out on fifth year reviews. Huh. And I think there was some building around here where the fifth year studio was mm. at that time. And um, it was such a minimal job. <laughs> I'd come in once a week. And I think, were you doing it too? Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you come two years later, maybe? Or was. I think we all came in 64. 64. Yeah. I mean, we'd been on crits and so on. Mm -hmm. But basically, Peter came as <coughs> fifth year, system fifth year master. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With George Bolton. 
how this environment and in the AA was able to somehow fit the group or, or there's no kind of relationship uh, do you think that the AA in the 60s has something that made the ideas of the group go farther or? Uh, the, well I mean the history of the AA is sort of moving from one scene of turmoil to another the, the type, there was a particular one at that time mm -hmm. um, which was it was the that being what a, uh, my history of architectural education is slightly sketchy, but there had been the Oxford Conference in was it 1958, uh, where part of the directive to schools of architecture is that they should be more technologically aware, and by mm -hmm. that they meant building technology, not invention and so on. Mm -hmm. And Bill Allen, who like, was either head of the building research establishment or something like that, was main mm -hmm. principal. And gradually over a period of four years he introduced a technology program that got more and more extreme and finished up with it being a full term for the whole school. Huh. Nothing they did was other than sort of weigh wet bricks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Really? Uh, so there was a great revolt against that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was round about the time that we appeared. <laughs> um, it's not as extreme, it wasn't as extreme as I'm describing it, but uh, that was, you know, it was a, a moment when the AA was sort of saying, you know, we've got to stop and recount mm -hmm. what we're doing. Uh, Bill Allen left and then the next principal was John Lloyd, I suppose. Yeah. So. Mm. Well, it's very That's interesting uh, what you think uh, and what you say. Uh, as it was, or how you think it was in your personal experience at the beginnings and the formation of the group, because normally we will have have this kind of comic by Peter Cook to say the, the official story. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. which is the unofficial the story of, of no. Margaret? <laughs> That's what I want to hear. I mean, not the official one. Yeah, I I don't know that there is an unofficial one. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it which is yours, than for instance? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, I you, I only sort of appear with Ron and Warren mm -hmm. in '62-'63. So these guys were, you know, I don't know other than what they've told me. <laughs> what happened in the you know the greasy spoon at Swiss <laughs> Gothic? <laughs> uh, if there was a the greasy spoon in Swiss Gothic, uh, what it was all about? So. You don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember me getting in. What was it? Maybe that store? Uh, uh, but it was David entirely got, like STEM. Hmm. But you and Peter were, were working at Kibbit, so. Yeah, I'd been retired from my first job in Nottingham, mm. and to avoid the embarrassment of my friends, I got on the train and came to London. <laughs> I got a job at uh, Cupid's, where Peter was, and where there was a fantastic group with extremely hairy wrists. I was always envious of people, men with hairy wrists. And uh, he'd just come from working for SOM for three years. Oh. I, I thought I'd, I'd hit the goal. This, I was sitting next to a man who'd work for Skid Mines and that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was, and then uh, I met Peter, I didn't know. Uh, Hazel would probably remember, I think, that they, they must have been married then, I'm not sure. Uh, what, um, and with, with uh, I showed him my thesis project, and he showed me what he was doing. Then we did some competitions, and, and then there's my these other young people all of this age who could not get their work published. You couldn't. There was no, and it was a simple. Yeah. So then you do it yourself. Yeah. And uh, stick your fingers up. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have a I uh, have to. We have to, in a way, thank uh, Cupid's for because we used to just do it in the office. Yeah. yeah. And, and you see, um, one of the last thing, it was totally different to now. You had a job, they knew they were really big. If you got to work by nine o'clock and you were still there at five, fantastic. So because they knew you could just walk round the corner and get another job. Unlike now, where you have to uh, fight, for your, fight for your job. Also, you weren't regarded as a, I think it's a kind of economic unit. I get the impression from students who get jobs, they really have to earn their money. You know, you know, yeah. Of course you didn't earn much. But uh, that's, 
Quite accidentally. Yes, I mean, I remember being very lazy at Cubits, I'm afraid, at um, Houston, I'm afraid to say. Uh, yeah, well, and this is another <laughs> problem with my. Team. I was very lazy also. Cubits, <laughs> he was very lazy. But I was the one that got fired. Also, <laughs> 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 there was something about it. <laughs> well, I. <laughs> say, there's another dreadful moment. I've been fired by people. Now, that's there are not many people who are fired from the AI. So, you can I've got a severe dysfunctional personality that manages the, the, the work. So, the office is full of people. Too. Yes. Just and remember, though, you're the one that's here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I'm the one that Robin Middleton comes up to and says, Look, Dave, I think you better go because if you don't go now, you're certainly going to be going in about an hour's time. <laughs> In a different sort of way. Is that right? Gosh. Nevertheless, if I, it, it was for churches <laughs> because then, you see, when something like that happens, you have to yeah. invent and so then I went to exactly. Virginia. Yeah. So. The, the strange acoustics in the building we were in, it was a Belfast roof truss and a group of architects over in one corner on one side being about 150 feet away from people on the other side nevertheless could hear the conversation intimately huh. and maybe David was bad-mouthing Theo or something, is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> it just wasn't fair. David, you know David Wilde? Yeah. 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 yeah, he used to set fire to his waste paper, <laughs> to his basket <laughs> so we all had to leave and get the building <laughs> <laughs> he <was> <laughs> and he didn't get fired. <laughs> These are things that matter. He was the first architect in London to wear bell bottom trousers. He, had, he initiated the Mao Dai, you know, the, uh, uh, the Dai, which had all important dates if you were on Maoist in China. You know. uh, he was the man who launched uh, the, the, the carrier bag, the Vietnam bag, yeah. so you could get in more. It's a real nice sort of bourgeois uh, protest, isn't it? A carrier bag full of uh, nice clothes with the flag of North Vietnam on. That doesn't resonate with people. But, but I, I think we're at the point though where we ought to open the floor. It'd be lovely to. If, if, are there questions around the room? Can we do that? It'd be wonderful to. It's a rare opportunity, everybody, to ask your questions, prove David wrong, <laughs> but you're curious for things and you want to find out more. Anybody? Don't be shy. David, you're going to win the argument. They're not going to, get, they're not going to tell you the story. Why they're in there. No, it's a question of um, At any point um, during this time, did you have a sense of destiny? That's a good question. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's a brilliant question. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'll just share my view, but I, I, I saw trouble ahead. Financial, emotional, professional trouble. <laughs> and I, I think I've been staving it off ever since, moment by moment. At any moment, the disaster could befall. You know, I, I, I never saw an ascending career. I never saw ideas turning into built works. And maybe the drawing was the flat equivalent of a built work and the drawing became adequate therefore you try and make the drawing as representative as possible of what you have in mind because you're never going to build it the evidence is the drawing what was it like emotionally professionally personally to watch some of the ideas get realized by others I, I'm curious, as, as we watch, let's say, you know, which is one way to describe the relation, the, the influence of the group. I mean, there were ideas circulated and they were communicated so effectively that it's not hard to map mm. influence and to see it in others, sometimes not so far away, who in fact did realize and it's, built in very big form things that would remain as drawings or images. Well, what it, was that like? It's you? painful because Norman Foster at the moment right. is building a museum in the Bowery in New York City and it's only 25 foot wide because it fits in between existing buildings 
but nicely there's an elevator which climbs up the outside wall facing the street painted needless to say bright red and of course slightly orange red and this elevator can either take people up to the upper floors or it can serve as additional <laughs> exhibition space. So the finish inside the elevator exactly matches that huh. of the galleries. And we were doing that. You can point to any number yeah, yeah. of projects. Yeah. And I feel like going down there on opening day with a placard, you know, <laughs> and saying, we did this with a picture of what yeah. we did. Mm. We did the hard part. We did the, yeah, we thought of it first. Yeah. Where's the acknowledgement? Yeah. <laughs> I once had a letter from I once had a letter from Sir Hugh Gasson which said, Dear David, uh, you may see published a house which looks remarkably like your last project. Really? Please <laughs> <laughs> know that we had never seen it before. <laughs> Good heavens. But I I, I think um, uh, uh, because when I was here, I thought I thought I could do it. I just James the rubbish. Who are these ridiculous people? I can do yeah. it. Yeah. After a certain, uh, but then it comes to where I had to admit I couldn't. Oh. But but not building it gives you a certain freedom. Yeah. It gives you a certain license. So yeah, um, so when I say I would say I can't. I can't say. Sort of fail, really. But I like his re- reference to this flat paper. Yeah. That's your the surface yeah. on, on uh, the right. Well, I mean, I think part of what makes the the, the work and the career of, of the group so interesting today is, I mean, to get beyond the discussion of technologies and they're changing today and they did back then, which is almost a too fast summary of the situation. I think it's fair to say that architecture surrendered a, surrendered a certain quality by becoming professionalized and corporatized and organized the way it did in the last 40, 50 years. And I think mm. the argument that Mike is really making is that I, architecture exists in the form of ideas, and those ideas get represented in drawings, in buildings, in other things. But I think the great legacy of the group, surely, is the argument, and many have made it for a long time in buildings like this, that architecture is a culture of ideas more than anything. Mm. And it's not about mapping influence and saying, we did it first and they did it later, or they spent $150 million doing it and we drew it on a screen. Mm. But it's really an argument, and I think that's what's so beautiful in these, and I hope everybody gets a chance to go upstairs and look at those kind of documents today to see that that's really where the bigger argument lies. And I would say the one thing that can't ever be surrendered, and in fact, if a school like this has any job, it's certainly to bring that belief in a culture of ideas back and not just servicing a profession, which is what architecture has been so long. Again, something that's incredibly compelling in this generation, I think, well, not just amongst nice. yourselves. I had cause to use the word precipitate in an article, and um, I didn't mean it in the sense of a headlong collapse or fall, a precipitate huh. crash. Um, it had to do with the meteorological sense of the word. And when I looked it up in the dictionary, it said vaporous ideas or moisture deposited and condensed on a surface. Mm. And I thought, that's, that's exactly what yeah. we do. We have these vaporous ideas in our head, <laughs> and they're deposited on a two-dimensional surface. Yeah. And... Um, but That's it. To, One? Yeah, I always have the feeling that the others probably all wanted to be architects. I never read the sort of huh. I wanted to. <laughs> they tricked you into them. Yeah. Or the third. Yeah. Uh, but, but, I, but do you wonder about that? Because these, as David said rightly, these old men sitting here, they had a certain amount of fame, and if not fame, notoriety. What prevented them from turning it into a practice and actually making buildings? <coughs> One had all the uh, acknowledgments of uh, knowledge by other people of what one was doing. You would think that it would be a stepping oh. stone to a career, so, but it never became that. Did Except you, in Ron's you, case, perhaps. Want to, you want to really want no. Well, yes and no. I think it's parents that want. To. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that was good to be mine. 
answer to the question. It was my mother who I thought I had yeah. should have a sense of destiny, not me. So. <laughs> I think I think there's a slight misconception because the the group is lacking yeah. these two two <coughs> sort of dead members, as you might say. But I now, I mean, because of that, I was shocked to. I don't know if it was you, Mike, or Peter telling me. So there's a school that uh, Ron Heron designed with another architect, the, the LCC then, Prospect, which was on Grays Inn Road, which I'm tell, yeah. told now is a pile of rubble. It, just, it came down about a year and a half, two yeah. years ago. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So huh. it's not, you know, the, the group had within the six of us quite a lot of building experience. Yeah. So it wasn't that we didn't have the opportunity exactly. of an architectural career. It's we didn't think it was the way yeah. that we should go at the time in the early 60s. Yeah. You know, we, we quite definitely turned away from this. So thing. you gave up a proper, all of you gave gave up up a proper job, job. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, I mean, there's, uh, where is it, a certain amount of proper jobs somewhere. Mm. No. It's a proper job tag. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a proper job. But it's still sitting there. Yeah, this was what where Ron and Warren and myself met was designing the South Bank Art Center. Oh. So you know. Oh. And, I mean, I'm not going to go into it now, but to, if analysing that particular project, it has a large number of very, uh, very prominent characteristics which are very much part of the off-gram work. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's made of concrete and it's got shutter marks and it's got precast panels, you don't read the, the more um, abstract nature of the project. <laughs> do, do but it, you know, one came away from that to see how you could, yeah. how you could develop those ideas without the concrete. Mm. It's big work, destiny, isn't it? Do you have a sense? Of, do you think we need to? <laughs> um, that, that's what I wanted to know. See, this is why people don't ask you a question. You ask them back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak my word. It's a complete accident. I'm yeah. more than surprised that I've finished up where I have. So I've always sort of envied people who have this trajectory. They, I can't remember it was management, but do you, uh, they ask you, do you, how do you, like, if you work in a university, they're always saying, that, how do you see the next three years of your career? <laughs> <laughs> I'm job seeing, seeing tomorrow. <laughs> 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 I'm convinced I'm next. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, you said to me first, I feel I always have felt I'm like a leaf, mm -hmm. blown around. Mm -hmm. And so I mean, it to him, he blows me this way, yeah. and I mean, you <laughs> blow me down the stair. And I mean, so I've never, I've never felt out of control. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think they are, really. I think I think that's a yeah. I think with the leaf I think we've finished with the yeah. conversation. David, that's beautiful. Well, thank, you. thank you. No, no. Uh, I think I, I just want to thank everybody and thank mm -hmm. thank you, um, Michael, <coughs> Dennis, David for coming in, Francisco for organizing the event. Everyone, that the conversation will carry on well past this afternoon. So uh, we'll get everybody back well, together yes, I in the next version. <laughs> I really would you. What is it? They find most sorry. No, 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 no. Most interesting about the sin, the sin center, or oh, that's <laughs> what is it about it which still resonates? Uh, it must resonate. Yeah. Should we leave? Yeah. Anybody want to pick oh, that oh, up? What? Well, I, uh, I mean, I'm interested in. Francisco's other choices for first project because most, in fact all of them were the first works of an architect who has gone on to make much more developed and actually constructed other? his buildings and so on, yes? Isn't that right? Uh, I'm the only one whose career in a sense fizzled <laughs> after the Sin Palace, you know, and um, uh, 
I think so. The inclusion of myself in the group, I think, is interesting because <laughs> it's a real one-off, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, um, I mean, that's a too difficult question now for Finnish. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> but you're asking for all the choices uh, within Archigram or all the choices in general, because. No, I'm just thinking that it's, no, because it's not a show only about the first works so that one can make a comparison mm -hmm. about that first project compared with a much later work mm -hmm. that we might be more familiar with. Yeah. Because everyone's familiar with Foster's later buildings, mm -hmm. but probably far fewer people know about that delightful little structure that's in the show mm -hmm. and it's interesting to compare the development in his work from beginning to now and yet when you include the Sin Palace there's no later work that might be mm -hmm. whose seeds might be contained within that first <laughs> project so I'm, I'm really am I the odd man out in the catalogue of I, I have to say not in our map I, I think it, it, I mean, really, the, the idea that we tried to take forward is that we were looking for projects that communicated ideas that yeah. can be seen to shape the conversation, the discussions, nice. the debates, yeah. not just of its time, but I think in a way, because we're all children of those discussions and debates, yes. architecture as we know it today. That was one secret ambition of it. The other one was, was very simple, which is to say ideas about architecture can be shaped through the making of projects. Yeah. yeah, which in the current in the current yeah. kind of industrialization of histories and theories and design cultures is sometimes lost, I think, on an audience yeah. on all of us worldwide. Uh -huh. And I think there's a great hidden argument you all are making in those kind of projects that, in fact, they can be engines of invention, and not just the execution no. of a deadline, you know, the finishing of something, but they can actually be a way where things can be discovered. So, yeah. in our view. You're no different than the one on either side of you in 1962-63 because you were each see. opening up and communicating yeah. an idea that really do does resonate across not just that group but to this day I think. Yeah. So yes, some have built more than others. Yeah. Some well, have I, stolen more than others. I'm glad you, know. you said that because I don't want you to now go and take my work down and say, "Oh my goodness!" You wanted it back here. It is. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's a question here. Yeah. It's not. It's a statement. Oh gosh. Oh. I know now. But I'm not an architect. Um, but I'm. I, Associated with Michael and have come to understand our program. And it was simply I heard you speak about you fizzled out, and I guess because you didn't build a building. But I just want to say when we were talking about frugalism, remember? Uh -huh. The John Johansson, uh -huh. how that is a that was a form, you know, the concrete frugalism. Yeah. And then we get into the 60s with the archogram. We didn't fizzle out because hmm. living in the 60s, I know what we went through. I grew up in the 60s. That was when all of a sudden society, we yeah. wanted to be different. We wanted yeah. to make a statement. And I don't think you all had to make a building the way you, you influenced a whole generation beyond structure. Yeah. You were helping us be to be individual thinkers and creative like the music. Mm -hmm. And then you were taking those of our mm -hmm. that. <laughs> but there was something going on where we did not want to be like the fifties, like our parents and movements like this yeah. helped us <coughs> to become individual thinkers and mm -hmm. And parents yeah. raising individual thinkers. So, quit saying this will Yeah, well, no, you know, <laughs> David and myself, we're masters of the art of self deprecation. <laughs> Dennis, the British art, I should say, of self deprecation. Dennis is more American in them. Dennis is not like that at all. But we don't really believe that about ourselves. Now I speak for David. I mean, David will say, oh, you wouldn't want me joining you or something like that. But he doesn't really believe that inwardly. 
And I wonder, that's another conversation for another time. Why do the British put themselves down in an amusing way? Hmm? It appears to be the best way to conquer the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming in, and thanks, everybody, for joining us for the conversation. Come, come, uh...